Well, All righty, we're recording, so you can get started. Great. Okay, great. Let me just move some of my tabs here. I've got a lot of tabs open. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, you guys are going to go down here. Okay. Can you see my slides? There we go. Hi, <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Anderson. Um, I am the current director of science communication at the Center for Research on Ingredient Safety at Michigan State University. That's a whole big mouthful. We call it CRIS. Everything has an acronym, right? Um, at Chris, we work with researchers from academia, governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and industry, and we focus on chemical ingredients typically found in food. So if you've ever heard a report about, you know, some sort of contaminant, some sort of scary sounding ingredient, well, we've probably looked into that, and we have a whole series of content that we put out to the public to help them really understand what some of these ingredients are, why they're in our foods or our cosmetics, what purpose they serve, and most importantly, are they safe? So that's a question I spend a lot of time answering. And as you can imagine, that takes up um, the whole the whole, the whole whole space of science communications. We kind of cover all of it in this area. So in this presentation, I'm gonna talk a bit about what that looks like. So today's objectives, you know, where are people getting their science information from? Again, keeping in mind this is the, the information I'm putting out is some general science and also food and ingredient safety related. So where are people getting their info? Why does this matter? The power of relevant, timely content. We're gonna look at a case study. And then, you know, I'm going to help get you all started on your science communication journey. This can look like a whole host of different things. So the content I'm going to cover is a lot about what we've done at Chris, but these concepts are applicable to your everyday life too. We don't want you to, I don't want you to go away from this presentation feeling like, well, that was really cool for a research center. That's not relevant to what I do or what I'm capable of doing. And that's, that's not what I want you to take away from this. What I want you to feel leaving the session is empowered to really control your narrative uh, as as it relates to your career in science or to the research that you're doing. So let's get into it. Where are people getting their information? You know, and what should we consider before engaging? So who do we want to reach? There are a lot of people in this world, and without an absolutely massive budget, it is incredibly difficult to meet all of the communication preferences for every type of audience. You know, that being said, data exists in every niche group that you may want to target, so we can learn exactly our audience's um, communication preferences if we have a large enough budget. <laughs> a lot of it comes down to budget, um, but most importantly, we want to know who we are targeting. So if your content is not relevant to a whole swath of the population, stop trying to reach them. That's that's not going to be your, your area. So at CRISP, what we want to do is connect with the general public. So our approach is going to be a little bit broader than other approaches. And we don't have a super massive budget. I like to say that, you know, we could do a lot if we were the Kardashians, but we're not. I don't have billions. Our center doesn't have billions. So what we do is use our brains. <laughs> we have a lot of brain power and we can be very creative with the algorithms in place and with the content that we do have and that we can put out there. So that leads me kind of to my next point. What do we need to be aware of when we talk with the general public? And this one is a little bit lighthearted. Oh, I stopped listening. If you're not going to make an effort to be entertaining, I'm not going to go the extra mile to listen. So this is a joke from the resident alien on the TV show American Dad. Um, obviously, this is a joke, but there is a very large kernel of truth to this. We are very much so focused on entertainment. Um, we like our information to be interesting. We want it to be funny. We want to be entertained constantly, especially people who are not completely fascinated with science or the mechanisms around whatever you're studying, they, 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 it's just kind of like a blip in the radar. So if it doesn't catch them in some way, they're not going to care, unfortunately. So how does the general public get exposed to science? I don't know. You can kind of take a second thinking about this. Netflix, yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily Netflix, but in for an American perspective, um, that's the data I have. I don't have any truly global data, but I, I imagine it's not dissimilar. Um, most people are ex in America are exposed to science through entertainment media. So Pew did some research on this, and Pew is a popular research data gathering firm here in the U.S. 81% um, of Americans watch some sort of science-related entertainment. So you're talking shows like CSI, Grey's Anatomy, Big Bang Theory. I mean, there's just so many more. 
Um, and they, a lot of people credit their exposure to science content from entertainment media. And a lot of this creates a very favorable regard for science, technology, and medicine, but it also sets some very unrealistic expectations. Um, and it also doesn't necessarily represent how science works in the best lens. You know, as we can imagine, some of this is beginning to change. We talk about, you know, Netflix entertainment media. We're talking about Shows like Netflix are going to be heavily curated. They're going to be heavily edited. What we're seeing a switch to, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, are things like TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and TikTok feeding uh, Instagram, which feeds Facebook and one big continuous share loop. Um, and don't get me started on YouTube. So, right, you're going to talk about all of your, you're talking about all of these um, platforms that are not edited or curated. Um, beyond an algorithm. So that's something we'll talk about in a little bit and why I think science communication is important. So our audiences, where else are people exposed to science news? And is this something we can influence? So before I really get into this, we need to talk about what everybody has available to them in terms of communicating. There's this uh, acronym called POEM, and that's for paid, owned, earned, and media. So these represent the channels that you or your organization is going to have that will um, help you connect with people. So paid, obviously, those are going to be your advertisements. That's going to be when you dump a bunch of money into a group and they're going to put your content in front of people's faces. This is can be effective, but we also know it takes a lot of exposure in order to get people to really absorb that information. So that means lots of money. Um, if that's the way you want to go. And it's not necessarily trusted because it's paid. So owned, these are going to be channels and communities that you build and curate yourself. So this is going to be like a trusted Facebook group you build or a TikTok channel that you create or a YouTube community. These are going to be more of those communities that you are completely in control of. This could also be a blog, a website. I mean, it's anything in the digital sphere that you get to control, that you get to, I don't want to say manipulate, but you are the like king of the domain, so to speak. Earned media. Now this one's a little different. This is going to be when say like a journalist reaches out for you for an interview. I mean, that's kind of when you know you've made it a little bit. When you have journalists coming and they're saying, hey, I saw your content. It's it's fantastic information. Come share. I want to talk with the world. So this is going to be, you know, news journalists. It might be another blog. It might be another YouTube channel. I mean, there's a lot of other um, earned media channels or earned digital channels that you can share your information in. So for science news, we know the majority of their people, of people still get science information from traditional media, such as, you know, like CNN, New York Times, you know, local TV stations. These are all, again, kind of would be earned channels. And this is still a large area of engagement, um, science engagement in particular. It is changing a little bit. There's some updated information post-2020, like pandemic, but there's still a lot of research going on people are still getting their information from more of those curated channels. But again, that's that's now, five years from now, it might be different. I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can spot some trends. Um, so now that we have like, you know, say you make a, say, say you wanna put all of your eggs into the earned media basket or the local stations, that's something you can choose to do, but that is also gonna require a lot of relationship building, much like your own channels require relationship building. So if you wanna just put content out there and never have to build a relationship, you can you can do that. I mean, I've seen it work. <laughs> it's worked a little bit at our center, um, but at the end of the day, you still are gonna to have to have some conversations with folks and you're still gonna to have to build a network of people so that you can be found. And you're still gonna to have to do the optimization needed in order to build a network. There's no getting out of that really dreaded kind of like networking space that I know a lot of scientists really don't particularly care for. And that's not a, a, a judgment in any way, shape or form. That's just a personal preference. So let's see, where else do people get their information if it's through the news, through TV, it's going to be social media, what we're kind of here to talk about. Most social media users say they see science-related posts in their feeds, and this continues. Um, we know that 41% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 49 consider social media an important way that they get science news. You know, this is great for communicators in some ways because it's a channel that we can nurture. Again, it's a community we can grow, and we can have some control and influence in our little fiefdom. Um, but we can't control who shares our content. We can't control who sees our content. We cannot control what the algorithm does. If they change how the algorithms are feeding content to people, we can't, we can't control that. Um, that's why you're going to see a push to newsletters. 
you know, everyone's like, give me your email address. I want a newsletter. That's because they want to help get out of the, they want to get into your inbox and out of your feeds where they have no control. Uh, again, that's just a kind of a smaller trend, but we can explore that a little bit later. So how can we build an engaged science community on social media and what do we need to consider? So to build an engaged community, we need to know more about the individuals who follow science themed social media accounts and we need to understand their why. There is a why for a lot of this. You know, and about eight in 10 adults, 81% cite their curiosity about what's happening in science as a reason they follow news on the topic. We were starting to see this shift a little bit related to the pandemic. People were like, okay, science is clearly important in some way because it's impacting my health. But at the end of the day, we're still looking at right around 81%. Um, so one tactic we can absolutely use when we're trying to build new audiences to our social media channel is to focus on emerging technologies, um, sharing information that may be new to followers or may present existing knowledge in a novel way can help generate more engagement because science news followers are more likely than average to share interesting science related content via their social media channels. So if you have some really cool content that you put out there that's super shareable, super clickable, you're going to get more of that feedback. It's a bit of a feedback loop. Um, and it could be something that's like really old technology. And we'll cover that in the case study a little bit. It can be old. It can be something that's been around for a gazillion years, but you have to find a way to present it and make it relevant to folks again. And sometimes people take comfort in seeing something that they've known for about forever, that they've used forever, they've heard about, and they're like, oh, wait, there's some new way I can use this. There's some new way to engage with this. There's something I didn't know. Sometimes people really like that. And we see that people who care about science will share out science in things that surprise them and delight them. I don't like the word delight that much because you'll hear that a lot. Like, you got to delight your customers. Well, you kind of do a little bit. You got to entertain them at least. Um, and that will, we'll, we'll see more of that entertaining or really informing in a way that is surprising. So engaging content. What types of content do people share? Now that we have an understanding of the people who share science news, we need to really understand the types of content that people are sharing. So this doesn't have any TikTok. I just took some of these <laughs> from Facebook, but social media users often share visual content, such as posts with a few words, a quick video call, video with a call to action, like please share, like people will share that, you know, they're, they're primed. They want to have a call to action if they've been primed with it. Um, you know, they also like visually interesting stuff, things that make them laugh, again, entertainment, humor, things that aren't going to take up their entire day. Um, but there is one type of content, and this is always really funny to me, but there's one type of content we cannot beat. I have looked at all the data, and the one the one content we cannot beat, I don't know if you can, can guess what this is, um, the content that is most engaging, something like this. We can do absolutely positively everything right. We can create the most interesting content with, you know, flying cats and pizza and exploding supernovas, and we will not outperform an inspirational quote. Not this quote in particular, but inspirational quotes just have a hold on us <laughs> as, as humans, and we're not going to outperform that. So just, just remember, like, if you're not seeing a lot of engagement on your post and it's really cool and it's really interesting and you're like, why? And you're like, well, it's because you're not an inspirational, inspirational quote, you know, and that says something about us as humans. Um, and that's that we like to share stories, you know, imagination and shared experiences help gain followers and they help us to put our work and our um, science into context. People want to talk with another human. They do not want to talk with an uh, AI bot, regardless of what people say. They don't want to talk with an AI bot. They don't want to have that sort of uh, interaction. They want to have a real genuine connection. They want that authenticity. You know, we are storytellers as humans. We share stories and we connect with others. You know, it's innate to us as a society. I mean, we even put, as humans, we put together so much. We see patterns where there aren't patterns, stories where there aren't necessarily stories too. I mean, you're going to see that a lot the more you get into the internet, which I'm certain you all spend an enormous amount of time on the internet. So you can see how imagination really flourishes there. Um, but we need to think about our content in ways that involves human curiosity, that is also meaningful and informative. So... What does that, what does that really mean? So let's talk a little bit about storytelling. We're going to talk a little bit about what is, a, what makes a good story in general. So telling stories is of course, an excellent way to share information. We can write long form magazine articles or blog posts that contain all the elements of a story. Um, 
and we can create short documentaries to share on social media that are story driven, but that may not be the best fit for every type of message or every personality type or for what you're trying to achieve. Um, but we also know that the elements of a story seek to create tension and resolution. And with that tension, we invoke emotions, right? So that's kind of the heart of a really good story. Um, at times, it's really appropriate that we do this as scientists, but at other times, we shouldn't do that. We don't want to do any, we don't want to invoke un, undue emotion for something that won't help, for something that will just cause fear. So we have to think about how can we share information and what does that look like? So we're going to say, what are the elements of a message? So let's think about, instead of telling a story with tension, let's think about the who, what, when, where, why, how, and the call to action takeaway. We always want to have some sort of call to action or a takeaway on a message because people are people want to act on something. You don't want to just tell them some cool thing and they don't feel like they can share it or should share it. Or you don't want to say, hey, this thing is happening. Oh my gosh, it's so important. And then there's nothing to it. I mean, what do they do? So you always want to have a call to action or a takeaway. Um, a lot of the posts that I write are, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of boring. I'm not going to say they're super exciting. I write about things like, you know, like, I mean, sugars, right? Like sugar isn't the most exciting thing ever. Um, baking powder is one that we have tons of, tons of hits on. We're like, what, why, why, why are these things interesting to people? Well, it's part of their everyday life. They're exposed to it a lot, um, but they still want to have some sort of call to action. So in every post that you'll see, I'll explain the, what is this ingredient? You know, where do we find it? What's the science say? Is it safe for us? And then I have a section called the good news. Um, and, and, 99% of the time there is a good news to share. So the good news is the takeaway that I want them to, to have from the message in that it's, it's safe when you use it in X, Y, and Z form, or researchers are working on this in X, Y, and Z ways, or, you know, whatever I feel like would help people put this into context in their life. And by having that call to action or a takeaway, we help people really stick with the message a little bit more and understand what our intentions are. So that's something to think about whenever you're crafting a message, you know, and not every message is going to be like the who, what, when, or why. That's just something to think about when we don't necessarily have um, tension to build or a huge story to tell. So why does all of this matter, you know, in academia, this, this, in academia and in many other sec sectors of society, um, researchers measure success in peer-reviewed publications, um, grant awards, research output and, uh, output, and other similar metrics that fellow researchers understand. So fellow scientists, fellow researchers, fellow academics, they get this. But often neglected are is the science communication portion, um, which does not engage with with it doesn't engage with the public you know you'll have all of these wonderful papers collecting metaphorical dust in digital publications that are only consumed by a handful of researchers who understand the science and are immersed in the specific fields that leaves out a large portion of society so why does this matter well when the media and the public and policymakers cannot easily access and understand research or the science behind something, um, we're leaving an opportunity to provide um, engagement and a deeper understanding of research and context of the research. And we're leaving a whole lot of folks out of the conversation who might be impacted by the research that's being done by you all or by the um, by the policies that might be that might be created and it, as part of somebody else's life now. So, I mean, we really need to think about the people who are impacted by the research that we all do. Um, and we need to make sure that there aren't, people aren't misrepresenting, misunderstanding our research and creating undue fear in the public consciousness, because there's already a lot of fear out there. If you have created something or you are doing something that people need to be aware of, you don't necessarily want them scared of it. You want them to be able to engage with it and feel comfortable talking about it and feel comfortable reaching out to a fellow researcher or to their doctor or to whomever. Um, we don't want to be creating fear. We just, we just don't. And I think that sometimes in order for some of these earned media channels to continue earning viewers, you get a lot of clickbait headlines. You get a lot of things that might not be representative of the science that can scare people 
or overstate the science too. That's another thing that's really tough that we see a lot, particularly at Chris, is someone will overstate something, <laughs> whether it's like, it, it, it's not, it's not great. It's not great. We see it in medicine too, where they're going to say, this is the next cure to X, Y, and Z. And it's it, not really, <laughs> not, not always. So we don't want to create these expectations that we cannot meet. That's another reason we really want to think about communication. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why everything just chimed at me. Um, but it did. No, oh, that's my... Is my slides, are my slides moving for you all? What I see is why does this matter? But now I see the academic difference. Okay. I don't know what just happened. My computer just won't for a second there. Okay, so why science communication? Why should researchers participate? Establishing a science communication strategy and activities puts a label on what we are doing so we can define a goal and find the right experts and put resources behind activities. You know, this ensures researchers partic um, participate in communication efforts that benefit specifically Chris, but the same can be said for any person putting out their own research, that when you have a name to what science communication is, or when you have a focus on what you're trying to do, then you can find the people you need to find and you can set aside time for that portion of your work. You know, why should researchers participate? Accurate information. I talked a little bit about this, but we have all read articles that misrepresent the science or misrepresent the risk. It is our responsibility as researchers to help guide the conversation so the work that we do and accomplish um, has the desired impact rather than becoming unintentionally warped into something different. Context is key. As scientists, we can provide critical context to conversations that may be missed by folks who are completely immersed in the field. And then removing the mystery. Scientists are not always stereotyped in the best light. I think we've seen that a lot in media. They're not always, it's not always great, you know, but by being people, by being approachable, by representing work in your own way, um, rather than communicating with strictly academics and other scientists, you're opening it up to everybody to ask questions. So it's demystified. People don't feel like they are afraid to talk to their local scientists that they're like, oh yeah, I can come and have a conversation and they'll help me out and I won't feel bad about it and I won't be made to feel stupid or some sort of way. So do you need to be on the internet and do you need a digital presence? This is something that some people, people will debate this. Um, this is going to be my opinion. Um, this answer does depend on your personal goals but I personally believe it's wise to have some sort of digital presence. You know, academia, research, and influence are not what they used to be. We know that we cannot always depend on the systems working the same way as they have in the past because we have access to technology and influence, and it has changed in unfathomable ways in the last 30 years. I mean, it just has. Um, so what does that really mean for us? Well, we get to kind of make it up as we see fit. You know, we can be responsible for our own digital narratives and being responsible for our digital narratives comes with a lot of responsibility, but at the same time, it allows us to control our story. It allows us to provide context to research and it helps us to build a powerful network that you can leverage. So you can build your own network that you can leverage. It's not just dependent on somebody else or some sort of institution. So that's a, a little bit about where personal brand comes into this um, and where your research brand and your research focus come into this, but it's important. So let's look at the power of relevant, timely content. So I'm gonna, in this section here, I'm gonna kind of provide a case study and I'm gonna put a lot of things into context that I hope will kind of round out what I've been going on about here for the last about half hour-ish. So what are the outcomes when you prioritize science communication and you build consistency? So at Chris, when I started out, we had maybe 80 hits to our website a month wasn't a lot. Uh, people couldn't find us. We weren't doing anything consistently. We didn't really have a huge network of folks at the time, but I decided, you know what, we're going to have to start from somewhere and 80 is a great place to start. So we, I started writing blog posts about ingredient research, about the research that we're doing, and I started to build trust in the community. And I started to build search engine optimization with all of our content by having information readily going out. So we have become over the years a, course, a, a source of trusted information and then the pandemic hit and 
we did a lot of social listening by Wayne and me. I did a lot of social listening. And we can talk about social listening in the Q&A if you guys have questions about that. But through all of the muck that was out there, I could see that Chris could use our center um, to really kind of help ease some worries and alleviate some confusion and help people focus a lot of the frantic energy into positive, helpful action. So from the beginning of the pandemic, we used our expertise and knowledge to help the public make responsible decisions related to their health. Um, while we didn't anticipate the explosive nature of the novel coronavirus outbreak, we used our platform to share the importance of you know, influenza vaccination, things that we knew could help with the help keep hop hospitalizations low. Then we did our best to help stop people making money off selling snake oil. We all know how that goes, you know? So we tried to make sure that folks weren't being taken advantage of. And then we distilled the noise further into a new area that we could, you know, confidently support. It was well within Chris' mission, and that is how to clean and how to disinfect. You know, people didn't know how to disinfect their homes, and they weren't certain of the products they should use. And worse, a lot of them were hoarding <laughs> products. We remember this, right? Um, so we focused on a simple ingredient that is abundant, affordable, with the ability to destroy viruses, soap, and bleach, cleaning and disinfecting. Um, and we continued to talk about foods and we continued to demystify and get rid of a lot of these myths that were out there through our social media and, um, and our blogs and our website. So one blog in particular, our bleach post had an outsized positive impact on the global community. Um, and I say global because all of our content at Chris, I'll, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit, is it's structured for a global audience. This is not just structured to be America centric. We are definitely in, you know, USA. So we have a lot of content. We talk, I talk a lot about um, the FDA and some of these US organizations, but we also look at the EFSA and the, um, the FDA and the EFSA have kind of an outsized influence globally. So you'll hear, you'll see in, in my post that we talk about that, but all of our content is structured to be international. We actually are working with a translation center here at MSU. We're translating it into French as our first next step based on our analytics. We believe that we'll have a lot of, um, we'll be able to help a lot of French speaking countries. And then we're going to follow, follow suit with some Spanish next. And then we're going to look to see where that can take us. So it's all global. All the content is structured globally. It's tagged to be global. So where was I at? Sorry, I had a little rabbit hole there. Um, from our social listening, we were able to establish that people wanted to disinfect their home, but they didn't know how to do it safely. And while the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization recommended disinfecting with bleach, at the time, neither organization clearly explained that bleach expire, expires, and it expires rather quickly, nor do they provide an easy-to-use disinfecting recipe and the protocols for home use. So we created gifts that were super quick and easy to share on how to calculate bleach's expiration date because it's not an intuitive process, at least the way it was structured everywhere I could find, not just in the U.S. It was very convoluted. Um, we created the bleach solution recipe in Imperial and international units to ensure that anyone would be able to make a recipe. You know, we filmed videos so that they could watch us doing it. Um, I went on WKAR NPR radio to share it with a larger community. And through the trust that we had established through open communication with the public and prioritizing science communication and building in consistency on our platform, it allowed us to provide the community with tools and information they didn't have during the pandemic. And it showed that in times of hardship, people turned to our center. And they were able to turn to our center because we had a strong foundation of um, information that was consistent, that was timely, that was written in a way everybody could engage with, that answered people's questions, and was search engine optimized so that they could find us. You know, let's go back a little bit to the, what I said about being entertaining. You know, people want to be entertained in their social media feel, feeds, but when they are looking for an answer, they want to be able to search and find it right now. So when you're structuring content, you need to think about how somebody is going to search for that content and find your content. Because if you're not funny, then you have to at least be findable through search engine optimization or other techniques. And Chris isn't funny. I mean, I, I can try, but I'm not funny. Okay. So what are the outcomes when we prioritize science communication and build consistency? We have a measurable impact. You know, while we've seen our numbers grow, the, the Bleach blog, you know, hitting a million views globally, we've sustained that growth and our other content has begun to thrive. And that is because of consistent communication techniques. And again, the search engine optimization. By being searchable, 
we are able to be the number one Google search result on many different topics. So we will have our content come before the FDAs, before the EFSA, before other organizations, basically by being accessible to people, by making it a conversation. And this is something that you all can do with your research. There is no secret sauce. It is consistency and structuring content in a way people can find it in a way that's natural to them. You know, what will somebody search to find it? What's somebody going to ask their speaker, their smart speaker or whatever? You know, that is what you want to be answering. So we know that if we are consistent, we are accurate, and we have legitimacy established, which I am very thankful for our center being at Michigan State, that's a lot of legitimacy that does help. And I'm not going to pretend like that didn't aid us. Um, but having intentional questions and the right formatting helped us not only with um, reach, reach large audience, but it also helps us get a lot of media. It helps us because experts are able to find us and we will email quick and do an interview when they need it. So because of our visibility and expertise, the press will seek us out and because they need accurate information too. So we've been interviewed on, on Forbes, Washington Post, Popular Science, NPR, you know, Business Insider, Inverse, PBS, I mean, Nova, we've, we've, I just did one in Discover Magazine. Like there's a lot of opportunity here because our content is accessible. And again, it's consistent and we have experts available whenever they need it. So being available to the public, not just to scientists, helps tremendously. So what does this mean for you all starting your own science communication journal journey? You know, I've spent a lot of time talking about audiences, about why you should care and showing what success looks like for me in the way that I practice science communication at Chris. You know, what about you and your journey? Um, and your, sci your science communication journey may look a lot different. It may just be a social media channel, or maybe it's a blog, or maybe it's just you developing your own personal brand and your own personal style. There is no wrong way to do science communication other than being sharing misinformation. Don't do that. Don't be the person who shares misinformation or sells snake oil. We don't like that. Boo. Um, but as long as you are sharing in a way that's authentic to you, then you are going to be in a good spot. So the activities in the following slides are going to help give you a place to start thinking about how you can frame and share your content. And I'm going to be honest, this is not just going to be like an overnight success. I mean, yeah, some folks have good luck on TikTok being an overnight success, but, but you still have to be consistent. You know, I've been working communications for 15 years and in this role at Chris for four years. And my success is not because I'm some sort of like wizard. It has everything to do with consistency, grit, and, you know, a little bit, you gotta have a little bit of luck there. Um, but just paying attention to what's around me and what's going on and building a consistent brand. So this first activity, I am hoping that you all will have some, a pen and paper ready. Well, that's one second. I see that there, you know, just let's pause for one second. I see a thing in the chat. Uh, oh yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Follow everybody on social media. <laughs> um, Let's see, one activity here. So we are going to, oh, goodness gracious, I'm pushing all the wrong buttons here. So have a pen, paper, whatever you want to do. I don't I don't care how your preferred way of communicating. Um, this is going to be to help you develop and clarify your focus. You know, before you do anything, you need to take time to develop and clarify your focus. It is one thing to be a science communicator. It is another thing to be a focused science communicator who knows and cares about their audience and provides their followers with focused, relevant, and timely content. Hold on. Okay. I want you to think about... You know, in a perfect world, what do you want people to think about when they think about you, your brand, your research? What do you want to talk about specifically? And what kind of action do you want to inspire people to take? And then in, in this activity, in as few words as possible, you know, about 25, and this is really hard. So <laughs> I, I'm not pretending like it's not, you know, reference the above questions and write about your science brand focus. So I say, let's take about like three or four minutes here and really do this activity, start thinking through this information. And then I can take some questions uh, you might have after the couple of minutes. So I'm just gonna turn my video off here really quick and I'm gonna let you all get to work in and I've got a little handy timer right here.
Hello there. I hope you had a couple of minutes to uh, to write this down. I don't know if in the chat or if on the, the 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 app, if anybody has any questions or any comments or wants to share, feel free to raise your hand or not really quite apt at which is the best way to do this. But I'll give them a minute if anybody wants to share. And if not, we'll move on to the next activity. Okay, let's head over to the next activity. Oh, Elizabeth, I can I can share. Yeah. I, I was just seeing if other people wanted to go. Oh. But um whenever I want people to like see me on social media, like as a brand, I would like them to know of me as a science communicator. So uh think of me with science art and science radio. So uh I've done some science art events before and science radio, but um now I'm hoping that people will also associate my name with guard. So um, we'll see how, maybe that was a lot more than 25 words, but we'll see how that can help develop my brand. Well, what you have right there is an incredible amount of focus. You know exactly the key areas that you want to develop. And by having that focus, you are able to be just on it, right? You know what you want to achieve. And right now you're focusing on radio, another crossover is podcasting, right? Everybody loves podcasts. So it's not just radio, it's podcasts. It's a bunch of transferable skills that are incredibly popular and in demand beyond just being a scientist, but for how people actually get content. So having that clarity and that focus absolutely is like awesome. 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 Anybody Thank else you. want to share or should I head over to the next activity? Activity time. Okay. So your purpose. People care deeply about authenticity and what motivates you as a person to focus on any given topic. They need to know why you care and why they should care too. So why are you studying or researching this, researching this topic? Why are you talking to people about this topic? And why do you care if people know about this topic? You know, for an activity in as few words as possible, write out the purpose for referencing the above, uh, referencing the above questions. And this should be something that you can easily memorize so that this can eventually become an elevator pitch for you. So I'm going to give you about five minutes here and I will be right back. Oh, sorry about that.
Okay, folks. Um, so this one, I don't know if anybody wants to share. We can, I, I noticed there's about seven questions. So I might just zip through these next two activities so that we can get to the questions at the end here. So let's head on to the next activity. So your output, you can put all sorts of content out, but if the content is not on brand or relevant to your followers or your mission, you're going to miss out on a lot of, of followers. You're going to confuse people. So think about what is your greatest creative strength? Is it short witty tweets? Is it a lovely photo with captions, snappy videos? You know, what is your creative weakness and what gets you excited? And then knowing your creative strengths and weaknesses, write about what you plan to deliver, how you plan to deliver it, and when you plan to deliver it. So what would you like to create? How long do you think it's going to take you to create it? And how would you put out a plan to be consistent? Again, this is just to get you thinking. So let's take about two minutes here, and then we'll move on to the final activity and some questions. Okay, now this final activity is about your visual and voice. Now, this is one that you're going to have to kind of take offline, um, but we can stop and just talk about this a little bit. And this is our last activity. So think about what colors you gravitate towards. What type of photos do you like? What do you like to wear? What makes you feel confident? Um, and do you express yourself formally or informally? What social media accounts or media personalities get emotion from you, either good or bad? So these are things that you really want to think about when you're creating your visuals and your voice. Because while we are all very complex humans, there are certain things that make us just feel good. And there are certain things we like to create. And that is how we want to build our brand and our voice. We want it to be things we really like, things we really enjoy, so that we can focus our content and create some outstanding stuff, knowing exactly what framework we want it to be in. So for an activity, you're going to want to choose some colors and fonts and filters or whatever it is that resonate with you. And you are going to use these consistently as you build your visual identity. Um, I have two links here, one for Canva and one at like this weird colors thing, which is really fun. It helps you like generate a ton of color palettes just by pushing a space bar. It's super fun. Um, so you're going to want to find fonts and a color palette that resonates with you. And then when you're creating new content, you're going to limit yourself to those choices. So your audience begins to recognize your content easily. And that will really help them say, oh, hey, it's, it's that person over there. Um, oh, I know Elizabeth, they do this, you know? So you're going to want to practice writing and shooting a video with a consistent style. So if you like informal writing, keep your content informal and fun. If you like to be, you know, over the top, that's fine too. Just whatever it is, make it you. And whatever you choose, make sure you make other choices that reflect that decision, right? So if you like are a very formal writer, you want to have long form blog posts, things that are more editorial style, like you would read in a major publication, you know, doing that in Comic Sans font is not going to get you the legitimacy that you're looking for. It might be confusing to people. And um, so, yeah, make sure that your choices make sense. And then Practice creating content on a calendar so that you know when you need to post and when you need to create content to follow your calendar. So this will provide a schedule and help your followers know when to anticipate new content. And this also helps build your search engine optimization. It helps the algorithms kind of depend on you, helps them boost your content. This is very important for the long game. If you commit to doing this, you want to build your brand, you want to 
start a social media channel, you want to do this, it is a commitment. It is not just something that you can do one one day, not do it for seven months and do it again and expect to have you know, a huge following. That's just not how this works. It has to be consistent and it has to be part of your routine so you get used to this. So that is a big activity. <laughs> That's not something we can do in five minutes. That's definitely something you want to take offline and think about. So I feel like in the last... Uh, I forgot my little arrow there. Sorry. In the last uh, few minutes here, I would like to answer some questions that you guys may have that, I mean, I feel like I just dumped a whole bunch of information on you in, in one hour, which is a bit, it's a bit tough. Um, but yeah, I'll take any, if there's any comments you want to put in the chat, or I can just answer the questions from the social, the, the app. Also, thanks for joining. This is fun. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, I think it's really good for the people who are attending this. A lot of you all are members of GARD or maybe now you're hearing about GARD for the first time. So I want to go and echo off of your questions, all particularly here. What about rapid diagnostics or the themes are you here for? And help you think about the questions that she was asking about um, focusing for your, what where you want to go from that. Like, what is your purpose? And then your purpose of from here. Okay. So there's some questions here from the app I'm going to take. So it says, how is social media important to scientists or why should it be important to scientists? I think we covered this in the presentation, but making sure that the community has accurate information from an expert is just something that we need. It's something that we need in society for all science, all medicine, all food safety, all ingredient, all of it. We need to make sure that our experts are experts and are not just allowing people on the internet who have no expertise to control the conversation because that's just, that's, that's bad. That's bad for everybody. Um, the next question here in this app is, um, does social media interact with scientists' innovation? You know, I don't necessarily know how to answer this question, but I can tell you that innovation is key to keeping audiences interested. People want to hear about innovation, but we also need to put it in context. So you might have this amazing innovation, this amazing technique, this amazing tool, whatever it is that you're putting out, and it has the potential to do something huge. We want to make sure that we can say, yeah, this is what the potential is, but not oversell something or make it so that people think that this product is coming tomorrow <laughs> or that this innovation is going to be here the next day so that it ends up stifling innovation because people don't believe it and they don't want to fund it. Um, something that's important to note is researchers use social media. Policymakers use social media. People grading your grants are going to be using social media. If they're seeing you on social media making these crazy outlandish promises that make no sense um, to the science and then they see your name pop up <laughs> in a grant and you've just promised the moon that you, and these folks know you can't deliver them. Just don't do that to yourself. You know, be responsible, be ethical. Yeah, that's, I think we should all, we should all know that. But I don't think that um, social media really does anything. I think it's, social media is a tool. I don't think it's going to help or hurt innovation by just being social media. It depends on how you use the channels. Um, how to overcome negative consequences of science communication through social media. <laughs> so this is hard. This one's really hard. It's very difficult to not want to just kind of attack people a little bit. It's hard to not go down that rabbit hole. Some of the things I see online are so fear mongering. It just, it, it hurts my heart, especially because the, the audiences that are usually targeted by these influencers often selling something um, are people who do not have the financial means to uh, buy whatever the product is, because and usually the product doesn't do anything. Um, they don't have; they may not have the financial means, or it's framed in such a way, uh, specifically around like new mothers. You're going to find this a lot in like the Instagram influence sphere, where they are being told everything is poison. Anything that happens bad is because you did something, you consumed something, you ate something, you were exposed to something, you got a vaccine, you went to the doctor, you did this test. Like there are a lot of people out there saying things that are incredibly harmful and are scary. And then they're selling something. They have this great call to action. You just buy my product here. You take my course here and it'll counteract all of that. And for me, I get real mad. I want to just go online and I want to just be like, you are wrong. I am right. Here is why. And shove a bunch of facts at people. And that is not good. That won't work. That'll never work. 
I've tried, I tried it on Reddit more than once, but it will never work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It does not make you friends. Um, does not get you upvoted. It does not get you any of what you would like. Um, the better way to approach that is to actually listen and to sit and to ask questions, to understand what people are thinking. You know, there's a reason they're having this reaction. There's a reason people are saying that. Sometimes influencers have had some experience that lead them to believe this. It's not always they want to sell garbage to people. Sometimes something traumatic happened or something they can't explain happened, or they were treated poorly by a medical professional or a scientist or a teacher or somebody down the line um, caused something to happen. So the first thing you want to do is listen and try not to be too mad. <laughs> listen, and then engage in a way that is with kindness and sincerity, even if they're not acting sincere. I know everyone's like, kill them with kindness. No, but you can't drown them in facts either. You know, that that doesn't work. We've tried that. I have seen scientists over and over and over again just go, ah, no, you're wrong. Especially scientists that have been trained, even doctors that are trained at such a high level, you know, they are told by their by the faculty members all the time when they're grad students that you're just wrong. That's wrong. Try again. You're, you're bad at this. Go back to the, the beginning. You know, it, and that's something that as a scientist, people get used to. You get used to having to go back and check your work again or to, to look at something in a new way. The general public is not, that, that's not how it goes. A lot of people will be very insulted, very hurt and completely shut down. And you don't want that to happen. So how does it, let me get back to my question. Sorry, I went down a rabbit hole. You know, how do we overcome the negative consequences? We put out fantastic content. We are inclusive. We are kind. We do not demonize people. Um, we can talk about an idea that's wrong. We can talk about research that's flawed, but we do not talk about humans. We don't talk about others poorly because that just is not going to get you the reaction you want. Because again, people are, are emotional. That's kind of how that works. Um, let's see. How does innovation, um, how, how does, how to combine science and social media and can we, can we give away prizes for joining? I mean, yeah, I don't know if you're going to get as many followers as you would hope by doing some of those sweepstakes things, but that's definitely one, one tactic to grow your following. Uh, you just have to be transparent in what you're doing, where the money's coming from, all of your funding. You will, if you're going to be doing something where you're giving it something away, you got to say why people are going to, why are you giving away something? Just explain it and hopefully make it very clear why you're doing something. Um, social media and health awareness combined. I mean, social media and health awareness, they go hand in hand. <laughs> you've seen fitness influencers, you've seen all of the things related to um, just all of them, they go hand in hand. They work together very well and making sure that your content works together helps a lot. It, it helps a lot. Um, being accurate, <laughs> Helps a lot. Hold on, let me just make sure that I am getting all these questions here. Do, 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 do. Um, how can we use technology to, for information dissemination? Okay, so this one's fun. Um, there are so many different ways we can use social media and we can use digital technology in general, but we want to really leverage the power of search engine optimization for a lot of our content. You know, a lot of this stuff is not exciting, entertaining. Like I talked about at the beginning, you're, if you can make it entertaining, I am, I'm impressed, more power to you. Please do that. Please, we need it. Um, but you have to make it so that when somebody has that spark of curiosity and they search for it, they immediately get an answer. That's what you're going to want. So you're going to want to create content that is optimizable, that's digestible, that is shareable, that is just really uh, quick and to the point. You're going to want to do, you're going to want to, you're going to want to practice that. It takes time to do that, but you can disseminate information in any way that makes the best sense to you. Um, I want to explore a little bit more what's going on with those like AI chatbots learning everything too. And feel like there's, there's got to be something to that with how we can also share information, but that's my, that's my own personal interest. Um, I think that's it. I'm not entirely certain what this last question is asking. Are there any other questions you all may have? I don't know if that was enough context. It's kind of a lot. That was great, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So I think that this was really great for Guard members to truly think about uh, where they would like to focus their story, how to brand and um, to find their purpose. So. Um, some really good points as well about whenever you're engaging with other people. And uh, I like what you said about the sweepstakes. <laughs> you definitely need to make sure you're saying where that money comes from. That could definitely uh, backfire. <laughs> no, it definitely can, real fast. People are mean on the internet. <laughs> uh, 
I wanted to let you all know that we have a next talk after this. We're creating a captivating presentation. So you can engage with people through social media, but you also want to make sure that your presentations are well uh, written as um, uh, an addition to that. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. And it was really great seeing you. Have a wonderful Elizabeth, thank you again. Thank yep. you again. We really appreciate your time. Yep. Very great. Great presentation.